Welcome to Live from Plato's Cave. I am Mario V. Plato's Cave is the most famous story of Western philosophy. It is the story of prisoners chained in a cave all their lives, watching shadows cast by a fire behind them. One of them is released and ascends to the surface, where for the first time in his life he sees the sun. It is a strange story, but Plato writes, they are just like us. According to Plato, we live in that cave. You can listen to Plato's allegory of the cave in the first episode. In each of the episodes from now on, we will use Plato's cave to look at life from a different angle each time. Today we will look at it through the lens of philosophy. From a first reading of Plato's cave, it might seem like there are two worlds, a world of shadows and a world in the light. But let's get deeper into that and see if that really is the case. Today our tour guide through Plato's cave is the philosopher Johannes Niederhauser. Johannes is the founder of the Halkian Thinkers Guild, which is a gathering of philosophers, thinkers, artists, writers and musicians who bring together the wisdom of philosophy, the revealing forces of art and the powers of technology. His book Heidegger on Death and Being has just come out. He teaches courses on subjects like Nietzsche, Heidegger and technology and he runs a popular YouTube channel called Classical Philosophy. I will link it in the description below. I invited Johannes because what struck me about his approach to philosophy is that it is not just about applying it. I met him in a course he was doing with Justin Murphy and there was a mix of artists, business people and people with many different backgrounds and from different countries. His approach to philosophy reminded me of a quote by the philosopher Martin Heidegger. I read this quote around 20 years ago and I think this is how I really became interested in philosophy. Although the seed for this was planted when I was around 10 years old, which I will share later in this episode. The quote by Heidegger really triggered something in me, because up to that point, philosophy for me was something abstract, as I think it is for many people. But I realized philosophy is about everyday life. It's not something you can use to get better or improve yourself, but rather it's something that, in the words of Heidegger, can do something with you. It's about everyday life and the ordinary stuff, like Johannes and me speaking right here on Zoom and you listening to us. But let me read you the quote, which is from the fundamental question of metaphysics. You hear remarks such as, philosophy leads to nothing, and you can't do anything with philosophy. There is no denying the soundness of these two phrases, particularly common among scientists and teachers of science. Any attempt to refute them by providing that after all it does lead to something merely strengthens the prevailing misinterpretation to the effect that the everyday standards by which we judge bicycles or silver baths are applicable to philosophy. It is absolutely correct and proper to say that you can't do anything with philosophy. It is only wrong to suppose that this is the last word on philosophy, for the rejoinder imposes itself. Granted that we cannot do anything with philosophy, might not philosophy, if we concern ourselves with it, do something with us? End quote. Johannes, welcome and thank you for speaking with me today. How did you come to be a philosopher and what did philosophy do with you? Uh, thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction and of course also for this uh, splendid quote from Heidegger. Um, I s learned ancient Latin and ancient Greek at school, a humanistisches Gymnasium, that's what it's called in Germany. In Italy it's called Liceo Classico a classical uh, lyceum after the uh, school of Aristotle. So you begin with Latin, then you turn to English, and in ninth grade, Greek starts. So I 
first read um, the Apology, Socrates' Apology, Apologia, in Greek, and the second major work was Plato's Republic. Not all of it, of course, but the most important parts, all the allegories or analogies of the sun, of the lion, and of the cave. And um, I also remember that quite vividly. I think it was <clears throat> probably 17 or 18 when we first translated the book. And what struck me about the cave was that I, at the time, and I still think so today, that it's a description mostly of our way of being in the world. The shadows always struck me as shadows on a screen. Uh, back then it would be television. This was a bit before smartphones. Uh, sometimes I now tell my students, you you carry the cave with you. Last year when London was still open, in 2019, a friend of mine uh, from, from Chile, Patricio Alfares, who's a filmmaker, and I went to Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus, which were the main tourist uh, areas and we filmed screens and people looking at the screens and then I, I'm reading the the um, the cave story um, which is then as an audio on top of it I think that's on my channel but uh, it's always struck me that the cave does much more than just provide some sort of a as a, so I don't think, first of all, that there is a two-world theory in, in Plato, but that he's trying to get at something much more profound than simply, as it's often displayed, some sort of a mere education, educational tool. The, the two-world theory is basically saying that there's the world of the shadows, the illusion where we live, and then there's the world of the, at the sun, the ideas, and that is the truth, and you can go there. But that's, that's yeah. not something, that's not how you read the uh, allegory. No, uh, because if, if that were the case, then the one who leaves the cave would leave the cave once and for all yeah. and would not return and would perhaps also more than just try to free the rest who are in shackles to leave the cave with him, at least those who would like to leave with him and then um, we would just but, all live on the surface sunbathing and yeah. being for the rest of our lives right exactly uh but this is not apparently what happens so that we could also ask just as an aside what's the question of philosophy that that always comes up is uh, is in one way or another how do we leave the cave how do, and that means how do we attain freedom? And if, for me back, back then already and, and much more perhaps now is uh, the insight that the, sh the shadows are not, not real. Right? They, they are very, if just speak in layman's terms, they are real, I think. The shadows are real, yeah. Yeah. They're, they, they're real shadows. And they're real shadows insofar as they structure the world of the people in the cave yeah and they they don't just structure it there and that's also you know we could get into figures like Baudrillard etc later on but maybe something just in the beginning that's interesting I'll show it uh to you but I guess listeners won't be able to see it there's a there's a short story by E.M. Foster called The Machine Stops from 1909 where Foster describes human beings who live underneath the earth in small uh, cubicles, where they're toothless, they're pale, and all they do all day is what we would now call Zoom, talk to each other over uh, basically the internet mm -hmm. and get notifications the entire time. And they, what they really want is to be affected by ideas. So the language is very Platonistic. Uh, it's interesting also that he says, um, the best thing are tensiary ideas, never original ideas, only something that's already gone through 10 or 15 or 20 filters 
uh, so that it can be corroborated as correct and true. Like, like um, they hear something on the news, uh, but before it comes on the news, it's already been gone to many people and different stories, and it's, it's something like that. And similar, well, yeah, but uh, or it seems, I mean, you, you, you uh, but think about just you know, um, the, to be affected by um, ideas in this man. This is something very I find almost uncanny that this word idea is so prevalent in our world today. It's an ancient yeah. Greek word. It used to mean the outer appearance of something, hey, idea. you can almost hear it, that it's something to, that, that can be looked at. Uh, with Plato, it becomes uh, something a bit different when he starts speaking about the idea of the good, which is uh, the sun. And we can get into that later on. Um, but the, the, this, the, the entrapment in the cave is um, something that's not left behind once and for all. And I think we'll get to this as we go through yeah. um, the cave, but it's actually something much more nefarious, namely um, that we have to uh, we have to be able to live with shadows and understand shadows as shadows. I think that's something that Heidegger uh, works out really well. Uh, he doesn't focus too much on the shadows, I think more on Alethea, and we can get into that also. Um, but it's also it's, it's the usual story perhaps is this, right? There, there are two worlds and all that, Pla that Plato is trying to say is how the philosophers are able to access the world or realm of ideas and hence they see truth and hence they are supposed to be leaders. And this is what is meant by paideia, um, paideia, sorry. And uh, they try to uh, teach the uneducated people, but the uneducated people don't understand them and they try to kill them. Yeah, we, we, we could spend an entire hour trying to understand the Greek word paideia, yeah. which is where we get, get the word pedagogy from. Um, but uh, paideia means to, it's, it's very difficult because we're both speaking in a non-native language at the moment. The English language only knows the word education, which is Latin and means to something like to pull out of someone. Um, but uh, educare is the, is the form. But paideia means something else. And it's also interesting that he's, he speaks here of uh, physis or physin paideias in, in the second uh, line. Um, of course, Schleiermacher, this is 19th century uh, German translator speaks of, of nature in terms of essence, but we could also perhaps understand this as uh, bringing so, so, someone into their own, right? So someone comes into their own once they begin to see um, what there really is, hmm. and what what genuinely um, makes up the world, and it's it's also interesting the way it's being um, described. But we can maybe stay on the world of well, not the world, but the realm of shadows. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're already getting deep into the cave. And um, um, what what if I understand you correctly? You started out with uh, reading Plato's version, probably in the Greek. And one understanding of the cave, if you just hear the story and what, what I was uh, explained as yeah. well is this two worlds view that there's the world in the shadows, the illusion, and there's like the heaven upstairs. And then some people have seen the yeah. truth and they come uh, back into the world, but the world is uh, not smart enough to understand them. And so we're already deep into it because we're, uh, so you're uh, originally German. Uh, you live in London. I'm I'm Dutch. Uh, the the text had, has been written in uh, ancient Greek and it has been translated. So there are already many dimensions to to the story that we that we can speak about, and we will I think just take it step by step. But uh, just to take one step back, because you you speak about what what uh, Plato uses the Greek word paideia, which means something like like turning or something like that, and it has to do with um, education and what i'm interested in in this series is how people can learn basically yeah if you see life as as a school and what i in, find interesting about your work is you don't exclusively work in academic settings and in fact your courses uh, are open to everyone uh, you do private tutoring 
and uh, you teach many things outside of uh, university and also on YouTube. And can you maybe, before we start going really into the cave, can you say something about your view on education and how you bring that into practice? Yeah, thank you for um, allowing me to do so. I'll try and be concise and um, summarize perhaps some of the ideas. One of the things that I had to learn almost the hard way is that and it's become very fashionable to, to bash academia. I don't uh, want to follow that line of argument. Uh, I think there are many very worthy people in many universities and you can have very good teachers everywhere. There are problems uh, with it, of course, as there is with everything. One of the problems, and this is some perhaps quite personal, is simply that I don't want to, I didn't want to follow the publish or perish mentality uh, and also have a bit of you know, problems with how we're supposed to teach at this point, using PowerPoint slides, teaching the same course every year, making the course in that sense uh, valuable and at this point also, you know, pre-recorded and then you're not really teach, you're mostly teaching of um, the correct secondary literature on a certain philosopher. But when you think back to what uh, teaching was like, you mentioned um, a longer quote from, from Heidegger, um, some of the best texts that he's written, for example, the fundamental concepts of metaphysics was a lecture course. I think it's one of the finest texts that he wrote, very clearly written also. Uh, his, his Nietzsche lectures are among them as well. Or you think back to where Heidegger came from, Paul Natorp was one of the Neo-Kantians. You read Philosophische Systematik, it's almost unfathomable. This was just a lecture course. Unfortunately not, I think, translated into English. So what I've uh, done with the, um, for example, especially with the Nietzsche course, the recent one, was a seven week course with seven lectures and I wrote a book for this. So it's, a, it's an attempt at an original interpretation of some of the most important texts of Nietzsche on mostly on the question of the eternal recurrence of the same and the so-called Übermensch. And this is something that wouldn't be, in my position at least, wouldn't be possible at university, not yet, mm -hmm. maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, or maybe not. Yeah. Um, and and maybe, is, but yeah. what I liked about the course I did with you is that uh, you made clear that it was open-ended. And uh, I, I work in a university as well. And one of the first things you have to do if you want to teach something is tell them what are, are they going to learn? So you first have to specify in advance what, what are the students going to learn from your yeah. course? Uh, and that needs to be approved. And then, uh, and I'm not saying that that's, that's bad in, in all cases, but uh, my answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> and, and yeah, that, but, yeah. But and this is the philosophical stance. Uh, we're, we're back with Socrates, oida uden eidos. I know that I know nothing. And I cannot give, I also, I, I cannot bring myself to start a seminar by saying, today's learning outcomes are, at the end of this, you will have understood. Yeah. Uh, basically, what happens with any in any philosophical investigation, or attempt to diagnose our time, or just reading a text, is that it leads to questions and more and more and more. I'm reading so this morning in preparation for this, I read again uh, the cave, yeah. and I thought again. Oh, have I forgotten this already? Why did I not? <laughs> it, it's it, it, there's nothing. It gives you more uh, problems, uh, basically. Yeah. Like, and, and, like one of the good movies you watch, you watch it over and over again. You see <laughs> something new every time, and it brings up new questions. And yeah, but also the almost the so it it, but, and also when we stick to, you know, when we format the cave, say, as. Um, as, as just the two worlds and it's just about education and we lose something we lose yeah. the because it's not clear really what what the shadows are and and what they exactly do and we have to, we are confronted with this again and again you mentioned before philosophy is really about everyday life now this is now we have to be careful because uh, this doesn't mean that we talk about how human beings drink coffee 
uh, or anything like this, but you know, to stay with Heidegger, Heidegger says the everyday world is actually uncanny. <laughs> There's something eerie uh, about just starting to think, how, how is it that we have any access to anything that there is or maybe is not? And what the cave also deals with is this distinction, the old philosophical question of, you know, a bit of a German uh, between Sein und Schein, being yeah. and seeming. And also, as we know from Hegel and also from Heidegger and others, uh, and also from Plato, of course, is that a mere seeming, a mere appearance can also become being something that yeah. then really is. I give you an example. Maybe this is also relevant because you're, you're speaking to filmmakers. If you have, as a filmmaker, you, you have a couple of actors who are supposed to who are not a couple, but who are supposed to kiss and have a um, have a very, um, portray a very erotic scene. Now, one of them may be in a partnership, and of course, they're only just acting. Mm -hmm. But as the act unfolds in a mere seeming and a mere illusion, and it gets more intense, and the more intense it gets, this mere initial seeming illusion may very well turn into the actors outside of their characters fall in love with each other or at least develop some sort of intimacy um, that they wouldn't have without putting on the act first. first. So this is an old, right, this, this, this back and forth between seeming and being also something that is, we say, for example, he, he's, he's, he's a mere shadow of who he used to be. This, this is something we say. It's an interesting expression, right? So he's no, he still appears as, as he did or she did, but they no longer are really who how i remember her or what they used to be like etc um so this, this, is a, this is a nice connection to to actually the first uh because heidegger wrote an uh, essay about uh, plato's cave called uh, plato's doctrine of truth and yeah yeah because they're basically uh so uh, I, he doesn't approach it as a two world theory but he's uh it's more like more of a journey with different movements and yes um, so the first stage is the shadow world, and um, so you could think if you read uh, the allegory for the first time, you think, "Wow, the shadow world is so bad," and um, uh, it's good that the prisoner gets out of there. But so what you talk about, with we're we're busy, I think, a lot in our everyday life. Um, what what is real and and what is only uh, appearance and. Uh, yeah, but I, I find that very interesting with with film and with theater that uh, we are we know when we watch a movie we know it's not real. Uh, we know there are actors there, but I think yeah some of the most profound insights I had in my life are from uh, movies and those are real. So I I really like the the shadows and I think. Um, but actually, this, has, this is a question that I've had for a while. I, finally, I can ask it to someone who, who studied Greek and Latin. But I think illusion has a bad rap nowadays. It's quite a negative. It's only an illusion. But I think the illusion is from Ludere, which is something like playing. Yeah. And is, is that true, that, that illusion is not necessarily bad in at least the, the, the time that Plato wrote this? Well, well so I think that Plato um, is seriously worried about uh, uh, skias, uh, which is the Greek word for shadows. Tas skias is plural for shadows, where, where I think to some degree the word schemata also comes from. So there is a, a, a worry. But, um, and th there is an, an attempt to, to and, and also because th there's nothing that 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 shines uh, through so th there needs to be an, an understanding of what there really is in order to also um, be able to as he says somewhere uh, in in the cave allegory actually later on is that the philosophers are those who are then actually uh, capable of um, and they are to be the guardians of the state um, because they can guide through the shadows that's what Plato writes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is at 520C. If um, this is the sort of the academic. anyone is uh, reading along. <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, but when you get to someone like uh, Nietzsche, the question is is never you know never really a, a moral one, uh, but simply whether 
a certain illusion is is life affirming or life denying and it's life denying when it uh, denies our instincts or negates um, a will to power etc and negates the the body etc um, but it's life affirming when it it leads to a higher version of oneself we could say perhaps so i think there is um, and and but 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 the question is for for plato is not just whether you know shadows are bad and the ideas are real no no th th there even are no shadows without the original idea without the original appearance but the um it it we 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 were always uh, dealing with um the the, the the conundrum you could almost say between what is and what isn't and um it's it is a task of the human being to find out what is and what isn't um and one of the things though because you mentioned you know, reading it through the lens of the two world theory uh, something we should appreciate especially after hegel is that a suspense of presuppositions is and heidegger does this all the time for example is very important to to attain an original access to a text yeah. so with, with yeah so but this is something very general i think which is useful if you want to just look at life and learn from life is trying to suspend your own presuppositions and yeah. trying to become aware of them and not not thinking that uh like you say that the shadows are something bad but like like heidegger writes that even where people only see shadows whose essence still lies lies hidden there too the fire's glow must be already shining so yeah basically whatever you see um you you see it because there is some light shining so you can see that yeah uh and maybe you can you cannot you you are uh, I, that's my own imp interpretation maybe you don't see it as it is because uh because of you you, you are in the way yourself <laughs> your own perspective is in the way and of course we can never get out of our perspective but even if we cannot see it it doesn't mean that that we're in a bad place or something like that i mean for me the the shadow world is not necessarily a bad place uh, it it depends. Uh, it if if there only are shadows and they are taken immediately uh, to to be genuine without being um, questioned or yeah. interrogated, then we're trapped in representation and Vorstellung. Yeah. Here's something that we can learn from Hegel. Uh, for Hegel, the understanding, this is very simplified, but for Hegel, the understanding basically works by the Verstand, Verstandeslogik, the logic of the understanding, works by representation mm -hmm. and by Vorstellung. It's something that is seemingly very firmly graspable. And the understanding has its place, for example, in the science of logic. So it, the, the representation needs to be able to hold, so something needs to be held firmly. To, to really almost to, to shine through, but then the act of reason is to be able to let go. Okay. And only in the letting go does the logic move forward. This is, so Heidegger and Hegel have here a similarity in the capacity to let go, right? Um, but the, so I think to come back to Plato, I think it's important that he does not want, that there wouldn't be a good polis a well-ordered polis only on the level of doxa, which is the word that's used, that's usually translated, so Schleiermacher translates this as Vorstellung, which then I think is um, representation in English. Sometimes doxa also means opinion, but right. it can also mean seeming, so as you know from Parmenides. But you could say maybe like, if you want to build a city or a society or anything else, you first make a model, but then, uh, you would have to let go of the model as well because yeah when that, you get going it will never be so very briefly because i mentioned for many days uh, there's a way of seeming way of doxa and way of truth alithia and we can get to what alithia perhaps means or doesn't mean but the, the you mentioned the model and that's very very important because there's a direct line for anyone who's interested in this from from plato's cave to 
um, post-modernity to the simulacrum or the simulation or the computer model, which uh, Jean Baudrillard speaks, for example. Um, of course, we could also, you know, the, the film Matrix was made. The Matrix um, is like, uh, you see in the beginning somewhere Baudrillard's book uh, lying yeah. there. So that's right. pretty much if you've seen yeah. that film that uh, you don't need to read Baudrillard anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, uh, uh, and, and what Baudrillard says about the postmodern, Heidegger says something similar in an essay called The Age of the World Picture, is that the postmodern conflates the map with the world or the model. The computer simulation becomes more real, hyper real, as Baudrillard says, uh, than what's actually there. And this is, I think, this is a, a genuine threat that already Plato sees. If we're only on the level of doxa and there's no more shining through of what uh, really is. Yeah. But this is never given. That's important. This is why this, the cave is so important. It's not given. It, it, it's only through an ascent and a decline back into the cave. Yeah, and you have to start. You have to start in the cave. You cannot just come at it from some neutral perspective. Yes. And then, so is that what the prisoner? So we're uh, moving to the second stage where where the uh, chains are released and the prisoner turns around. And uh, I would think, wow, great! Finally, he sees the the figures in front of the fire. But no, Plato says no. He 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 wants to run back. He wants to yeah. run back to the shadows because. The shadows to him seem more real than whatever like crazy visions he's starting to get. So is that an example or is that a way of saying that uh, for him the, the model or the shadows are more real than uh, well, what is closer to being as uh, Heidegger says? Well, not closer to being, but closer to the immediacy um, which we are initially um, accustomed with. We are, we are not yet taken out of, right? This is the, the they self uh, that is operative in us in everyday life. Common opinion, By, like the, the way, the common reality, basically. Yeah, you can put it like this. So, by the way, the first word of the politeia in Greek is kat eben, katabaino, which means I went down. Hmm. Uh, or declined, katabaino sometimes was just translated as decline. Um, so it is in a going down, interestingly also the Zarathustra begins with, so begann Zarathustra's Untergang, and thus began Zarathustra's yeah. going down. Um, so we can also almost think of the cave as, as there is on the first level of, of reading, there's an ascent upwards. It's at the same time, a moving downwards into the cave, because as the person who is freed and we're not given any reason for why, right? Yeah. No one tells us why this freeing happens. Someone which is just, it's almost forced to get up, right? This is very interesting. It's walking up under pain, but as the, the, as the ascent occurs, it, it, it's all only, um, it becomes, so you mentioned just now he wants to go back. It's exactly this. It's as someone walks up, this someone also looks back so actually goes deeper into the cave as he walks up. So do you mean that he, he, he finally, uh, the moment you, uh, you're you in it, you don't see what you're in, but the moment yes. you start to leave it, then you're no longer in it, but you start to appreciate what it is, or you start to be able to see your position in it. Yeah, the, the givenness, yeah. the initial givenness is withdrawing. Yeah. Right. And it's described very interestingly, not as, as you know, the ninth, so Schleiermacher, 19th century German translator, would have probably liked to uh, translate this a bit differently and, uh, and think of it as you know, a great moment of enlightenment and uh, for formation, education, etc. It's just naturally enlightening and, and joyful. It's actually all the way up described as painful. What's also very striking is that so what the the shadows, the skias, the schemata that they see, um, which uh, um, uh, are not themselves, so they see ducks and trees and houses and whatever, but they're not, so the shadows are not shadows of 
an actual tree. Mm. They are shadows of clay figures, so already of copies. So, so that's also very important, and also that the 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 flickering light of the torches, and we are never told by Plato who are those who carry the these figures around. We don't know. We're not told, and perhaps we will never know who, who this is. But there is in in the cave there are echoes, right? Echo is the Greek word where this comes from, a vida hal in German. So there there are echoes in the cave. So they they think that the shadows actually speak. So there's the, all yeah. the senses are um, hearing and seeing. There there's an entire argument by Hannah Arendt after Heidegger um, who would say that uh, it's in in the cave we lose the sense of hearing and it all turns towards seeing that's something else just maybe briefly to mention that seeing becomes more important than um than hearing that that brings me to to another question i have because um well in in uh, modern literature there's a lot of uh, emphasis on embodiment so uh i think in the in the past uh especially philosophy it was seen thinking is just like a mental thing uh, a philosopher is just sitting in the, in the armchair and smoking a pipe and uh, uh, that and, and thinking. But um, there's a lot of emphasis on embodiment. That thinking is something. It's it's social. It's physical. And uh, one thing that I was wondering about is what Plato uh, writes that uh, it's not enough when the prisoner turns around and to see the fire, it's not enough to just turn the head because he could just look behind him to see the fire. But it's important to, to turn the whole body and the whole body goes upwards. What do you make of that? Um, well, I, the, it, it's, it, I think this is why I, uh, think of this as, as an analogy more than maybe an allegory. It doesn't try to tell us something in something else, but it speaks analogously to how we exist. Mm. And it, it therefore it uh, what's being described is a genuine ascent and a genuine path that's, and of course, you know, the, the path is one of the foundational images of European civilization. When you think of Odysseus, for example, uh, it's it's uh, Heidegger speaks of his thinking as a, a thinking path, not the one thinking path, but one of the paths of um, of thinking, and it's yeah, it's it's not uh, um, it, it it and so I'm not going to say it's not just theory because then we have to wonder what does theory mean. Well, theory means Theoria used to mean festzug, right, a festive ceremony, mm. um, and 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 then uh, came to, oh, but also means to look at something, and to look at something means to approach it, and not just to look at it abstractly from from a from a distance, and again make up models. It's 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 what's important is to be um, on the path, and there's actually also a, a word that that. Plato uses uh, when when the um, when the path upwards begins, the question T S tin comes up, which means what is what is this? What what does it mean to be? Um, and he has to respond to this question. So this question only comes up in 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 the walking up. It doesn't just come up from sitting. Right? So because when you sit, you only see one you see everything from one perspective and then when you woke up you see at least maybe you don't see everything clearly but you see there's maybe more than you start to ask questions you you see less clearly than before before yeah. you saw perfectly confusion. clearly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and and all, so you mentioned confusion um the word here is apurain yeah um and that's confused but we all know the word aporia aporia is like when i whenever i speak about philosophy with, with people, aporia is one of the first things that I try to explain. I love to be confused. It's one of the things to embrace, right? Yeah, and, and aporia means, I mean, not, not as an end in itself, right? Because then we're just confused, but yeah. Uh, but aporia means, so it's often translated as paradox, but that to me is too, too logical um, in, a, in, a, in that sense. Aporia means roadlessness. There is yeah. a pathlessness. He doesn't know yet the path. 
but he knows he knows that the shadow world is not not all there is but he doesn't know okay what what is there what is what is then real yeah he's clueless and this is why and this, this is why this this is why the genuine philosophical question then comes up what is but what is if if yeah. if, if now he begins to see the the clay figures and again he's then forced to leave the cave this is something that there there's a, a pain is mentioned again almost yeah. enforcement there's a necessity uh to to leave and and step outside and once though we are outside he's he's blinded well imagine you've lived your whole life in a cave I'm 38. I've lived 38 years in a cave, and I come to the. I think I, my eyes would hurt, would hurt as well. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're back with uh, Foster's machine stops. You know, yeah. Pa pa pale skinned, uh, teethless human beings because they never eat anything. Yeah. They only drink. They only drink uh, fluids, um, and they he needs time. And actually, this is this is what this is what Heidegger brings up really strongly in. Uh, Plato's doctrine of truth. There's a shorter essay version that people can read, and there's also the the longer book. I would probably recommend anyone coming uh, for the first time to Heidegger to read um, uh, to read the shorter essay, which is in Wegmarken, which in English is Pathmarks. It's uh, an essay version of uh, this his interpretation, and um, it has to do with how he translates Aletheia. We can get to the question of truth in a bit, yeah. but once the person steps out as you know he first has to spend the night that's very interesting to me because my tendency if i want to learn something is i really want to get it and study and focus on it until i get it but what heidegger says it takes time and what, what hegel says is that okay do that but then let it go and and sleep the night or something like that and you cannot force it. You cannot force understanding. You have to spend time. And it's especially interesting in, in relation to art, which we'll also speak about. If you want to appreciate uh, a painting by Rembrandt, you can just look at it for one minute. You have to sit there maybe for a couple of hours and just look at it. And then it starts to move like, uh, like it's a movie almost. Yeah, but only when we take the time to also gaze only at one painting right? the, the way we run through galleries is is different this uh, is is it's a it's a non-seeing seeing yeah um and and this i think also has to do with the cave where we don't have the shackles that we're in is when we don't take the time to and this is true theoria to gaze at something and by letting go something then discloses itself of itself yeah, it can speak to you. You can listen to it. And if you yeah. are, so the, the normal, uh, or let's say the modern uh, way of doing theory is basically building uh, explanations, uh, causal yeah. frameworks, uh, models, but not really taking a step back. And I would say, listen and speak and, and let your presuppositions move them to one side and just see what comes up. Yeah, but by the way, as we are in the seventh book of the Republic, we could just as well mention it uh, that um, very briefly that when um, Plato himself then interprets this image or this allegory or this analogy of the cave that he, you know, he gets, we don't have to get into dialectics, etc. But what he says about geometry, for example, um, which Schleiermacher interestingly translates as the art of measurement, of measuring. And that's, that is a knowledge, it's a genuine knowledge. It's yeah. on the third level um, in terms of the analogy of the line. But, and it, it is concerned with that which is always, aeontos, that which always is. However, what the sciences, and this is something that's now becoming apparent ever more in our time, I think, do not get, Plato already knows this, is they do not get back to Arche or Arche in, uh, in more, more of an English pronunciation, which means they don't get back to the origin, to the ground of what they're actually looking for. Yeah. They only do the following. Uh, they prove their own hypothesis, 
hypothesis. The hypothesis is proven. So we prove we have the model and we find the model in the world and the world is then put into the procrustis bed of the model. <laughs> so you're and, moving in circles basically because you're only kind of yeah. explicating what you already put in. That's already what you get out. It's like, you know, uh, sometimes people quote Wikipedia in an article and then somebody quotes them and then somebody else updates the Wikipedia because they've read their article. Exactly. So, so this is, comes back to what I, what I mentioned Foster before um, when he talks about ideas. And so here, here's what, here's what their guidelines are for being affected by knowledge which they get through their tablets where they look at the entire world and give talks that couldn't be more removed from them. You know, so they sit underneath the earth. There's no life on earth anymore. And they talk about music in the Aboriginal time of Australia. And one of the most is completely removed from who and where they are. So the people in the cubicles. Yes. So here's, here's their guidelines. This is a direct quote from Foster. Beware of first-hand ideas. First-hand ideas do not really exist. They are, but the physical impressions produced by love and fear. So the best thing to do is to get tertiary ideas, is to get ideas that have been filtered and filtered and filtered again. And um, so they become shadows of shadows of shadows of shadows, you could almost say. And here's what, this is what Hegel understands, right? Um, the, there is an immediacy in, in the cave and the, this immediacy is to some degree mediated if you like that sense is mediated but the mediation itself takes place through a medium namely the, the shadow theater of which the inmates are not aware now our technological tools and i'm holding up my iphone now what they do is they mediate the world to us without us ever even knowing how that mediation process takes place a path to freedom though for Hegel would be to allow ourselves to mediate the sense to us. And with Heidegger, we could say, and I will just uh, repeat what you said before, to begin to hearken or attentively listen to something or someone until it discloses itself to us. And that's a genuine uh, event of a mediation or disclosure yeah. of sense. And that's, that's a nice connection to his... Because he, he, he writes the essay, Plato's Doctrine of Truth. So he wants to say something about truth. And that's, a very, for me, a very difficult idea at first, but also very logical how he writes about truth rather than, uh, let's say, truth as measuring something. So if I say today is Friday and I can look at my calendar and, oh, I'm correct, it's true that today is Friday. Yeah, but then we have to wonder what true means, right? Uh, exactly. So true would be, in that sense, true would be that I have an idea and this idea corresponds to something in the real world. Yeah. And then it's true. So in physics, yeah. we try to, we have an, a hypothesis about, uh, I don't know, black holes. And then we uh, construct a theory and then do a measurement and then, oh, our, uh, it's true. Uh, I don't think a physicist would say that, uh, by, by the way, but that's maybe the idea of how, how science would work. But what, what Heidegger presents yeah. and what you present in your book as well about uh, uh, death yeah. and being is a radically different idea of truth. Could you explain what that is? <laughs> so I'll, I'll say, yeah, uh, I'll say something else first. If, if we indeed live now in a Kantian universe, of transcendental idealism, then it's even stranger. Then the moment when we find the Higgs particles is when they actually come into being. They, they are not before. They are in the noumenal. They are only when they are corroborated um, by the categories of subjectivity in their objectivity that they begin to yeah, so we don't discover something which is like an like an island waiting for us to be discovered, but the moment of discovery is also the moment it comes into being. Yeah, and that's that's that that's already very dislodging. Uh, but it, it and, and interestingly, Kant um, in the first critique, it, when he starts 
the, the little he has to say about truth, he says, uh, is this geschenkt, uh, which means it's, it, that's granted, that's given. What truth means is simply correspondence between representation and object. So a representation can become, this is the strange thing, a representation does not have to be uh, a representation of a, a genuine, a literal object in front of me, but it can also be Vorstellung, can also be imagination, imagination then become, and, the, and the model. And then, the, and then this is why I mentioned the procrastus bed before. So yeah. what we are looking for when we say, when we speak about true or truth, what we're looking for is basically just correspondence between a subject's yeah. representation and an object. But what Heidegger um, says in this lecture course from 1930, which I think, uh, and Bogdan Minka, who's a Romanian uh, philosopher, has written on this also, is um, this is where Heidegger is really ignited as a thinker. He leaves behind the language of being in time and he simply goes through the, the question that already came up in being in time to some degree, which is, but what would, so on, on what level or on what plane does this correspondence at all occur? How is it at all possible? So he doesn't say that correspondence is not, isn't real. No. Yeah. But how is it at all, where, where is it that this occurs? And there must be, according to him, a first or initial disclosure or openness or clearing within which correspondence at all becomes possible. So when Heidegger speaks of truth, he almost always means aletheia or aletheia, which is ancient Greek in which he translates as unconcealment. Yeah. Because uh, lethe is uh, in, in mythology is the river of forgetting. Lantano means I forget. Uh, it also means I conceal um, or shelter. And that's that's the word that, that Plato uses uh, in uh, Alithia in the, in the allegory, in which is always translated as truth. So yeah, if but... you go to the surface, you discover the truth. But Heidegger, uh, he provides his own translation. And, and I've looked at some of the translation for the ones we use in this course. But it reads very strangely because he speaks about what is more on he doesn't say what's what's more true but he says what is more unconcealed or strange language like that so truth is something about being unconcealed which already suggests that the basic state is concealment and then unconcealing is something with i can't wrap my head around it let's <laughs> summarize it like that it's 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 disclosure is rare it's it's a rare occurrence that something at all yeah. is right we're not naive realists in philosophy and just say everything around me is uh, the, the is something truly only comes into being in our respondence or responding to it and it's yeah I, this is is it there there's at the core of everything is self-concealing heidegger goes as far as saying this is immer eine Lichtung für das sich verbergen. In English, that's a cle clearing for self-concealing. Yeah. Um, the so so when you, for example, you look at Schleiermacher's 19th century translation, he uh, he translates to alethes or the uh, comparative form alethestera as uh, um, more actual or as true, more true. But true, if in the sense of uh, of correspondence. There is no correspondence. I mean, what what does the the, the one who is aporein, who is confusedly walking up and trying to find a path under pain, what's he what is he corresponding anything to? I mean, yes, we could say uh, he 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 compares the shadow, uh, sorry, the figures with the shadows. Yeah. Um, but in all, in order to at all achieve this, there must be something else at work which is now, so you can almost see how in the cave, when you translate this with Heidegger, is that this weird concealment of the cave begins to disclose itself, but as concealment. And this is what Heidegger says, however, goes wrong in Plato, um, which is that 
the original concealment or concealing that's always at work is forgotten. Yeah. We look at the steps outside towards the sun. And once we see the sun, and by the way, very important, only when we come back inside the cave, out of compassion, as Plato says, and by the way, also threatened by death, right? We're threatened by death when we come back in, um, stumbling back down into it. And we, we see the shadows only then as shadows. They only light up as shadows fully in light of the light of the, of the genuine yeah. light of the sun. However, what according to Heidegger occurs here in Greek thinking or European thinking, etc., is that the original concealing that's always also at work is forgotten. And it's assumed that now that the light of the idea of the good has been found, it's firmly established. And that in itself, however, is almost described by Plato wouldn't be possible because once we step outside the cave, we look at the sun and what happens? We're blinded by the sun. Yeah. As we're blinded by the sun, what happens is that we fall into a strange darkness from the clearest light also. That's so fascinating for me because you would see, you would think, okay, maybe you need some time, but uh, you get used to it. But the, the first encounter with, with light is it's painful. You cannot see anything yeah. because there are only light and you cannot distinguish anything. So if, if someone would ask you, what did you see? Well, you didn't see anything. You were just... Uh... You were just blinded, and I think if I uh, if I hear you correctly, then is is Heidegger's, Heidegger's critique about if you are on the surface, you should not forget the cave. You should remember the cave, and when you're in the cave, when you're back in the cave, because I sometimes I imagine maybe the prisoner goes back into the cave, and maybe in Plato's version, he he retains this memory of, or I don't know if you call it memory or access or theory of the sun, but maybe uh, he also remembers that this journey has he has taken many times before. And maybe in another version, he would there's nothing around him in the shadow world to remind him of the sun upstairs. So maybe he would just forget it. And that would just, we, would, we could start the story over again. Or you see, to complicate this even further, we still have a flickering memory as a mere image of the sun but we forget something much more fundamental, namely the path upwards. And now fool ourselves to believe that we have seen the light, are enlightened once and for all. And the forgetfulness of this forgetting is a much more nefarious one. Because you know this translates into many different areas. It, 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 it means to basically lose your sense of uh, self-critique. Uh, um, also, this is one way of thinking of it perhaps. To make this a bit more um, concrete. Yeah. So you you write in your in your book as well that yeah. which I really like saying. Well, what Plato forgot. Uh, you write as well that this is not a one-time trip. It's not it's not enough to just go up and see the sun and come back and that's it. You you understood something and now you've got it. Now you must go up again and again. And do you mean this in a literal sense that you have to make this journey again and again, or is it enough to kind of remember? Yeah. What you saw. And, and this, yes, no, no. no. So me memory is uh, e extremely important, but memory, as uh, Hegel works out in the encyclopedia, has the, um, is, is in, in, you know, there's all these memory theories from the romance and from, from the, um, the Renaissance period as well, where, where all they do is try and memorize. Uh, names or numbers by memorizing, as he says, if, uh, ridiculous images. Uh, so if, if, if a memory is just a, a mere image of uh, itself, just a flickering, but not as it were itself enlivening um, and, and also pulling, I mean, and it's a genuine memory, perhaps we could put it like this. If it pulls you more into questioning uh, than just uh, a simple certainty, Right. Yeah. So one thing that uh, um, that also that's very modern is to understand truth as certainty, as absolute certainty. And Heidegger is here very 
very far removed from this. If we just think that we now have certain knowledge of the sun and hence we can now take this light back with us, we have yeah. forgotten already the journey to the sun and that this journey is necessary um, again and again. And I think literally, and I think the strongest example of this in modern philosophy is Nietzsche's Zarathustra, who again and again leaves his mountain, starts in the city, begins in the city, he comes back to the city, he walks past the city again and again, and uh, there's, there is, and it's, it's about a decline and, a, and an ascent at the end, but it's only ever possible by going down into loneliness or solitude again, coming back out of it again and again. And I think this is also to some degree uh, the artist's uh, journey Right. The, the, an artist who, um, who's, who has to send off an artwork into the world and has to send it off again and again and then let it take on its own um, way of, of, of disclosing something or other or not. It's actually quite encouraging because if I think back to my own experience, there are some experiences I had that uh, I would say it's like a, at least a turning around but that's not that's not it. So sometimes I think people are waiting for, okay, but when does the moment come that I understand everything? But along the way, I think that's also a trap of education that you think that uh, at one point someone is going to give you a degree and that's it and you found the truth and that's it. But you maybe forget that along the way, there's so many moments where you realize something really about where just to world reveals itself uh, to you. And I've told this story about, about when I was 10 years old, and maybe this was when I became interested in philosophy. I went on this long journey with my mother to Malaysia. Uh, first time I left Europe. And of course, everything was very strange and very hot and uh, everything new. But in a way, that was also what I expected. I expected everything to be strange and different. Uh, you know, in my 10 years old, have, having never been outside of Europe. But then we came to the house of my mother's friends. And the thing that struck me is that they didn't have a coat rack. And of course, they didn't have a coat rack because, I mean, in Malaysia, it never gets below 20 degrees. So of course, they people don't wear coats there. Why would you have a coat rack? But in my world, it was like the one thing I thought, okay, all these strange world will come to their house. And even when I the first step into their house, their house was strange as well because they didn't have a coat rack. And I started wondering about, okay, if I was so certain about this, because in the Netherlands, you come into a house and there's always the coat rack. And it's very interesting because you can tell a lot about the people who live there by the, if it's a, it's a, is it a wooden one? Is it handmade or not? But I came back from that trip and it was like, everything was the same, but everything was different. And I've never been able until just a few years ago to realize how this experience, how, how amazing and fundamental it was, but I had just kind of forgotten about it. But when I think back about it, I'm just there. Yeah. So you were, you were saying an artist makes a painting and maybe at, in that moment, this is the painting. They're finished. And as soon as they're finished, it goes out into the world. It leads life on its own. And, you have to start your next painting, right? Yeah, and as Heidegger says, that he ha there's only one question. For him, there's only one question in his thinking. But he comes at it again and again. And I think there's only one question also for Nietzsche. And he comes at it again and again. And for Nietzsche, it is the birth of a new world that's life-affirming and not uh, reducing the human experience. And the, what Heidegger says about art is that art is itself a, a spanning open of, of world with a genuine artwork, if it, if it still occurs, is a question, of course, um, whether we still have art in that way. But um, I, for, for, I think... Um, With, it should be an encouragement that we 
there's there's a need to suffer through certain experiences again and again. Yeah. Uh, I think if if an artist, for example, um, thinks that he's found the one, they found the one technique to to do something again and again and then to optimize it, etc. Uh, it there seems to be something then that's uh, that's lacking, um, and I think perhaps that we um, when we come back to the the computer simulation and the model or uh, the pre-calculated uh, desired effects of something, though those are, they give us a seeming certainty over the world, but as they deny sort of the, the, the withdrawing forces are at work also, we, we lose a way of accessing the world because what, what art also is, is a way of accessing the world and making something apparent that we wouldn't consider in everyday life. There's a beautiful line by Osip Mandelstam, who was a Russian uh, writer, where he says that whenever we say, in, in, he's very similar to Goethe um, in this manner, and he says in, in everyday speech is, autom is almost automatic. But when we, when we read poetry, it inter that a poem interrupts the word. Though we begin to see again, and he uses, of course, the example of the sun, Osset Mandelstam does. Uh, he says that what we, begin, what we can begin to see with, with poetry is that whenever we say the word sun, it's actually not just one signifier of one precise symbol or object. It's we're taking a journey to the sun and back again. We've become so accustomed to it that it's now benign. But this is what, what occurs when we say just the word sun in a poem, perhaps. But, um, and also that a, every word is a bundle of, of light rays. This is another quote from Mandelstam. And this is what, what Heidegger is also, I think, trying to do in philosophy, right? Not just to go with the already enclosed, formatted, uh, agreed upon definitions of terms, as we try and translate them again. And I think for an artist, that's perhaps one of the approaches they sometimes take, right? If it's already agreed upon how you sculpt, to some, sculpt something or paint something, you have to have the technique. That's, that, that's, that's yes, you have to have the technique, etc. You could have a model of the perfect painting and then you would just study and work hard enough. And when you make that painting, you're the best. But this yeah, is an interesting contrast between uh, art and and, uh, and other technology, I would say, right? Because uh, an iPhone, you know, the computer is like, it's an optimization. It's like we try to create the perfect computer and every update brings us a little bit closer. But an artist who makes the perfect painting, uh, a painter who makes the perfect painting is no longer a painter, I think. I think they have to quit. <laughs> because that's what, what else can they do? Yeah. Um, and one has to be able also always to uh, to let go. There is to stay with the cave. There is no possession of having seen the cave. Uh, sorry, the sun. There is no possession of this. We we do not own um, the sun. We do not own the fact that we've seen it. We can simply um, and, and actually it speaks of humility, right? It speaks of Plato speaks of compassion at the end, speaks of the threat of death, um, and also the stumbling down you could understand as a humbling experience. It's actually not, you know, we're not walking back in enlightened and f fully bright, and no, we we're stumbling back into it, and then having, have, so similar to your story before, have to become accustomed again uh, to what we were used to in light of something other, in light of something new, and uh, this, however, once it becomes a mere given, it encrusts, it becomes sterile. Uh, and here, so we have to take the journey again and again and allow ourselves to be taken out of yeah. what we take to, to be again and again.
And if people want to uh, have some guidance with that, because the, the next episode will speak uh, with Mika Ball about uh, art and uh, we'll speak more about some of the topics we brought up here. But if people want to continue with philosophy and uh, obviously they can go to your YouTube channel because you have really many nice short ones there uh, that are also about, for instance, one, one I really like is about Space Odyssey 2001. The really nice explanations and original interpretations. Thank you. You, ha you have your book coming out, Heidegger on Death and Being, with yeah. Springer. I'll provide a link. And what courses do you have in, uh, in the next year, in 2021? There will be, so thank you very much, first of all, I was very kind mentioning all of this. Um, but so I've, I'll, I'll, I'll teach again some of the courses from last year. So I'll teach again Idleness with Dignity, which is on Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Nietzsche, also on education, uh, on, on what uh, a genuine leisurely education, disinterested edu education should look like with uh, Humboldt. Um, I'll teach again the Nietzsche course finishing the book i'll experiment next time i think with uh, with self-publishing for this one i haven't done that before and what else i've so early on in the new year probably in the first uh, three months i will give a course on early greek thinking on some of the main figures parmenides heraclitus empedocles and anaximander and then a bigger course on german idealism which starts with early modern times of Descartes and then goes off into Kant, Fichte, Schelling and, and Hegel. And can people contact you also for like personal tutoring or personal questions? Yes, thank you. That's, I, so I, I offer that if, so what, I've got one student, I've been reading Heidegger with him for four years. I've got someone else I'm reading um, uh, Plato with, um, others uh, just uh, have general questions from from different books so these are yeah, some some of them are students so they come for for an extra sort of uh, insight into some notions from philosophy and others just have general interests in philosophy that's very possible yeah right thank you very much Johannes thank you Mario thank you very much indeed if you want to find out more about Johannes's new book his YouTube channel, or all the other things he's doing. I link this in the description below. For more information about this podcast and how to support it, go to livefromplatoscave.com. One last thing before I go. This is an interdisciplinary podcast, and this means that some topics or disciplines will probably be more familiar to you than others. If you have any questions about what we discussed, now or in the future, Please do not hesitate to send me your questions. I'm happy to answer them whenever I can or refer you to other sources. Also, it will give me a sense of who is listening to this and what you are interested in. In the end, I want this to be helpful for you and whatever you are occupied with in your life. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you again next month.